Hi guys, Happy New Year's. Welcome to the Mom Series, The Misunderstanding of Multiplicity. Um, uh, this video is also going to go out to Flower Species channel, which is my other channel where I do cooking, crafting, um, political, I just talk about political stuff, spiritual stuff, you name it, play a little guitar, whatever, chatting, embroidery, whatever. But I've opened a new channel called Biash and Klutz Knitting and Crochet. It's Biash with a capital N, Knitting, capital N again, crochet, uh, and Klutz, capital K, all capital. I'll leave all the links down there in the information box. Um, it's Friday, and I wanted to introduce a few videos that I'm going to be talking about and this is the first day I felt human to put some makeup on and uh, moving a little slow. I've been sick for about 11 days now straight with fever and so I have to take advantage of when the fever is not raging and get some blood work done to make sure that my thyroid hasn't gone completely into a crazy spiral of what some people call a thyroid storm, but my doctor pretty much assured me, you're still making sense, so it's okay. <laughs> so we increased my thyroid medicine and uh, got an antibiotic going and doing blood tests to keep up with this. So for all you fine, lovely people that have been sending me prayers and good energy vibes and well wishes, um, <clears throat> um, I'm doing better. Okay, so I'm in my kitchen and I'm doing cyclone bomb cooking. What is that? That is, I'm taking my regular Monday make it stretch and doing it early. <laughs> so I finally got to the store yesterday and I just grabbed a few things and I'm just working with what I had left over in my refrigerator, in my pantry, and um, what I know I need to make me feel better always is chicken soup. And you, you guys know, those that you, those of you that know me know that I always parlay cooking videos into um, all my videos. Um, unless I'm sitting doing a little studious video or a knitting video or a crochet video. So I've been doing this a long time. Um, I'm not looking to become a cook. Um, Tar. Um, and I just I find it easier to talk when I'm cooking. Okay. So what do I got over here? Might as well share while I'm talking. Right? So over here, what I have is it is 9:33 in the morning, and I have my stock pot going with um, I've broken down. Two chickens that I roasted last night, and um, very small chickens I roasted them up last night. I threw the fat, I threw the wings, I threw the um, the neck, the you know all that good stuff. Um, the parts that the back of the chicken that usually has all those little itsy bitsy baby bones, I didn't throw in there because I hate. Even though I'm gonna strain it, I hate having them in there. And I might run into a few. I've got three medium-sized carrots. I leave the skin on. I wash them, scrub them really good. I want this to be really nutritious. Um, I do leave the skin, some of the skin on my onions. I basically cut up all the, the ends to my vegetables because that's what a stock is. Just throw it all in there. Um, I don't think too much about it, so um, I'm bringing it to a boil now. And then I'm going to... Once it comes to a boil, skim it, get all the gunk out of it, and then let it simmer for good. I might keep it going all day. I want it to get really deep and rich. Um, I grew up with my, um, in a restaurant basically, um, from the age of 12. Um, and we always had stock pots going. Okay. What do I have over here? Um, my fourth burner pan that I got at QVC. I gotta tell you, it's a really cool thing. And it's perfect. 
Um, so in here, I have. Um, you gotta be careful when you're steaming stuff in it. There's just so many things you can do in it. But you wanna be very careful. I've got my um, broccoli in there. I've steamed up two pounds of broccoli. Um, I've already shocked them into some cold ice cubes to stop the cooking and just keep them green. And I just want them al dente because I'm going to use them in here. This chicken soup, I'm trying to figure out what I'm making. This, I just want, I want a lot of stock. I want a lot of stock because I need it. It's keeping me, getting me better. So, um, and then I freeze my stock. So this could go a long time, um, but eventually I'll have some chicken soup. And like my grandma Rose taught me, I will have some chicken and dumplings for my chicken soup. I will have, there's my mother's mother, I will have, um, she could take a chicken carcass and make 20 meals out of it. I would have, a lot of times she would make the chicken soup for the whole family. Um, she knew how to pinch a penny. Depression baby, like all our grandmothers in that era, she would take a chicken, break it down in two seconds. Um, like, she was a real poacher. She would poach the chickens a lot and then uh, break them down. But if she was doing a roast chicken, she'd still throw the carcass down. Um, but then it would become chicken fricassee on toast later. It would become chicken and dumplings, and she often used Bisquick or Jiffy to make, usually Bisquick, to make her dumpling. And then it would become chicken a la king. She would make like a yellow roux one time, and a white roux the next time, which is some flour and chicken broth, and, um, you know, maybe some um, chicken pot pies, but very rarely. She'd do the pot pie. She would mostly do chicken a la king, chicken fricassee, chicken and dumpling. And then she would do what's called color her water. She would take the, the rest of the chicken soup. And my kids can't stand this, but when I first started making chicken soup, they would be like, Mom, we don't want sauce in our soup. But my grandma Rose used to always be making many meals at once. So she would always have her tomato paste out. And she would, like, get every bit of that little bit in the can. And she would dunk her spoon in the can to scrape it. And she would dunk the chicken soup water. And she would call it coloring her water. And it would have just this nice little light orangey look to it. And that would be our other soup. And she would put a little basil in that, parsley, make it more Italiano, throw some... Um, Parmesan cheese in it. So I'm hoping to do a lot of stuff with this because it's cyclone bomb, cold ass, windy cooking, right? So I'm going to pop my lid back out here and let that come up oil because I've had three burners going now and uh, I think everybody in my apartment complex is cooking right now and I don't want any power surges. So into this, I have one tablespoon of unsalted butter and I'm going to do about a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil from Wegmans, Challenge Classico. That's unsalted Wegmans butter. Um, the chickens were just um, regular they, they were little fryers. They, they said roast, roasters, but they were small. And then, um, I got them for... I got one for $6 and one for 5 No, one for $6.30 and one for $7.10. Now, if you don't have time to make a stock, you could do a really cool, just grab your roast deer chickens, break them down for $4.99. You know, grab a plain roast deer chicken, a few of them, a couple of them, whatever. Tear all the meat off of them, throw your carcass in there, and just get all your vegetables in. That's all I do. I don't make a fuss out of it. Nothing too fussy. 
once it comes to a boil, I'm going to skim it. Like a really good rolling boil. Um, meanwhile, turn this on. And I want to get this melted down. And uh, no. I guess really all of a sudden rolling. What's going on with the power surge this time? I want it to go a little bit quiet. Let me put that one. Keep it right on medium. So I want my meat to completely fall off my bones. And it's going to be a slow, a slow cook. Over here I have um, dry stock. I'm going to put that over there because there's water in there. Um, I have rinsed a package of cubed, already cooked ham. I don't want the salt in it. I really don't. So I rinsed the bejiggers out of this. I, I really just soaked it and drained it and chopped it down some more. Um, let's see. This is the one I used. Wegmans for $2.99. You can get all this. It's boneless ham. Um, after cooking, contains up to 17% of uh, solutions. Great in salads. Blah 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 blah. The sodium content in it is 680. A serving size is a half of a cup. There's four servings in there, so I rinsed it really good because I like to do low sodium. And for the soups I'm making. Uh, and they're going to have enough sodium in there. So after looking at everything I have, I think this is going to be a broccoli. Broccoli and potato and ham. Chicken broth based soup that I'm going to mash down later. And I might even throw a sweet potato in there. I also have sweet potato ends that I've caught that are in my stock pot. So I just have a little bit of everything. And everybody does their stock different. Some people throw their, um, some people throw, you know, you just save your vegetables, throw them in the freezer when you cut off your ends of your vegetables. And, um, wrap them really good. You're doing your prep during the week to make anything with vegetable, anything, romaine lettuce. Um, cut your ends off of it, um, your ends of your onions, your ends of your carrots, your celery, all of that stuff, rutabago, parsnips, whatever, your root vegetables, your beets, anything goes, because that makes a really cool minestrone, which in Italian just means big soup. So, um, okay, that's going good. Now, What I have here is, what I hope it's dry enough, I have my two carrots that I've chopped down, my celery and my onions, some people call it a miracois. Um, I just call it the base to everything. Um, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to call it the trinity, but sometimes she would throw peppers in it because that would be the trinity and leave the carrots out. Um, that's how much you're making, I guess. I like to put peppers in with it. And then I'm like, what do I call it? The Trinity plus the Miracle? I don't know. I don't try to figure it out. I just want my food to look pretty. I want all my vegetables to be chopped really good. I got one piece of peel there. I don't want it in there. Um, so, um, I'm going to get this all going. I'm using my spurtle. What is a spurtle? Uh, I bought it two years ago, and I've mentioned it on many of my videos, but i got to tell you guys something. This is one of the greatest tools you will ever have in the kitchen. I, it was uh, the advertiser on QVC, Mad Hungry. Lucinda Scala, her mother, went and found it. And uh, you have a short one, you have a long one, and 
they're beveled, and if you wanted to make like spatula, like um, when I was married, I talked about this before too. For those of you that know it, you probably get tired of hearing about it. But honestly, my ex father in law for a wedding gift made me um, a spatula board, and because they're they were German and Irish and. English and he had to have he was straight from Germany and he had to have homemade spatula like Italians have um, gravy or sauce or pasta on Sunday he had to have gravy and spatula so when I was engaged uh, I opened my gift and it looked like kind of looked like those paddle ball board that you got a bouncing ball to when you're paddling, but it was beveled, and he worked. He works with wood. He made me my dining cart, and um, my ex-mother-in-law had been showing me how to make spatula. She said the most important thing is you got to have a really sharp knife, a nice knife, and a good bevel board to scrape your little noodle dough into your um, water and fish it out with a little net. There it was, and at first I looked at it, and, went, and my mother's side of the family was there, and my father's side of the family, too. And I was like, how is she giving her a board for? Beveled. Like, like, beveled. And you put the dough on the end of this big board with a handle into your water, and you just shave those little noodles into little squiggly things in there. <laughs> My ex-husband and I had a lot of fun with that. We were like, yeah, we're going to have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother acted like she didn't know what we were talking about, and then she covered her eyes. <laughs> we got plans for that board. Okay. Um... TMI, my tempo, right? Sorry to my kids, don't mean to embarrass you, but adults have fun. Okay, so it's boiling. They're grown adults, they can handle it. Oh, this is looking good. More than that, it's clearing my congestion. Mmm. Oh my god, I love the smell of that. I should pop a little more garlic in there. Alright. So I'm going to set this down. And I like to use butter and olive oil. And I know that I have one something tablespoon in there. And one of butter. So I'm going to make a roux for this, even though... I'm not going to need a really large amount of room. I'm probably going to keep it two tablespoons of flour. And I'm going to use chicken broth. And then I'm going to use my um, broccoli. I'm only going to use half of it because I just want it to make it look pretty. And I'm going to make the roux sauce with the... I know a lot of people don't make theirs this way. I do. Everybody does things differently. You use what we got. You know? There's no right or wrong way. It really isn't. Just gotta let people get creative in the kitchen and have fun with it, for God's sake. Don't take anything so serious. Just, I worried about technique and pull and everything. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you wanna. I, I'm a stickler about. I want my vegetables to be a certain way because I want them to all cook right. Um, if you're making a roux or a bechamel sauce or a gumbo, you definitely have to follow some certain things. Like the longer you would cook your flour and your butter or your flour and your olive oil or your flour and your rendered down fat from whatever, you would want to keep cooking it. Lo the longer you cook it, the more darker and deeper it would get. And I know my mother-in-law used to, we used to make roast beef in spatula. Um... Um, Sundays, and then garlic and chicken and spatula 
on Sundays. And one was the, the garlic and chicken was a yellow brew. And the roast beef one was a dark brew. And you would have to just really cook that dark brew down really. But the vegetable one, it could be like This is going to be more like a cheese sauce with a potato. So I'm just going to get it to thicken. And I'm going to use my water for my broccoli, which is starchy. And I'm going to get my pasta going over here. And use some of my reserve water for my pasta. Pasta? Did I say pasta? I'm gonna do? No, I'm going to do a potato. I'm sorry. That's later. I'm going to do a chicken, spinach, and I'm going to do spinach, chicken, broccoli, and macaroni and cheese. This one's going to be potato. And I might throw in some sweet potato, too. And I'm saving one of my potato to make a sweet potato bread or pie. So that's that. That's going to just be nice and nice. Um, over here, I'm just going to grab my... Um, la, 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 la. My doctor's office was so funny today. God, they said, we have some blood recorded for you. Yeah, I was there yesterday to get it done. Okay, I don't see all the foam or what we call the schmaltz coming up enough to grab that out yet, so I'm not going to skim that yet. Eh, let me turn it off. I want to, you, everybody looks different, but, um, you eat all the ham while I'm talking to you. My grandma used to call it the schmaltz of the soup. Um, she put her spices in. Everybody, she put her spices in in the beginning, and then when she um, took the foam off the soup, she would. Um, she took the foam off the soup. She would grab all the spices because she said they did their job. And they did. And there I have two bay leaves. I have oregano. I have a little poultry seasoning. I have um, pepper. I have not salted that. I'm going to salt it at the end because I'm going to let this simmer all day. And the more you simmer your chicken broth, the more you cook anything, the more salty it gets because that's why it becomes like a... Um, you know, like more concentrated as you cook it down. So, there's my... I just want them to be glistening. I don't want... There. I'm going to struggle with the lighting today. I just want them to be glistening. And once they're glistening, my neighbors are going crazy. They're like, oh. She's been cooking since morning. Yeah, it's cyclo bomb cooking. Okay. I'm going to put my fat of my ham right in there. Everybody does this different. If you throw your ham in at the end, I'm not going to let this get too crazy cooked. I just want to cook some of the fat out of it. Just for the flavor. I'm going to slate between here and here. I want that to cook. Ah, finally I got a little schmaltz hip in here. Yay. Kind of in the right temperature with this stove. It goes up and down. Um, because, you know, when you live in an apartment complex, everybody is um, cooking at the same time. Um, so actually, I'm going to switch up burners. And if somebody plugs in something really um, cuckoo, man, you're on. Um, so I just have a little bit of, I don't have much to skim because I don't. Um, 
which is interesting to me. So I just want this in front of me so I don't have to lean in the back. And this can go in the back. My burners. Okay, so I have that one on medium low. Perfect. This one's on. It's going to keep bubbling. And I'm just going to um, use my little jar and skim some of it out. You're not going to be able to see when it's coming out, but you'll see what goes in the jar. Basically, I'm going to take my vegetables out of there. So, some of my thoughts about the new year. I'm going to be doing a video on all things Eve that will be the next. I'm just taking my oil out, which usually gathers around the middle and the sides of the pan. And then... I did put some of my skin in there because I want the flea, I want the fat. Fat is good for you. Um, you know, I, I'm always talking about integrated nutrition and health and everything. Um, diet. Um, when we did away with fat and we made everything low fat in the 70s and no fat ch uh, chocolate, no fat cookies, no fat popcorn, no fat. Um, <laughs> I always laughed about this one. No fat cookies, no fat paste, no fat potato, really? No fat potato chips? Okay, so people ate more of it. I remember in the 70s. Pasta was really encouraged as a healthy food because my dad had a pizza and pasta emporium restaurant with all-you-can-eat buffet, and we didn't just do pizza. We had barbecue ribs. We had mystique barbecue ribs. We had smoked barbecue ribs. We had beef ribs that looked like when you see the Flintstones driving away. We had those. All-you-can-eat for $5.95. We had... A all you can eat pasta bar in the 70s when it was really being promoted as a healthy food. So they could, the customers could come in and eat all the pasta they wanted. Um, and what that meant was we were in the kitchen uh, dropping down reg uh, penny rigatti, um, whew, linguine. Um, spaghetti, capellini, what else do we have? Rigatoni, um, shells. We had, every kind, we had a ton of different kinds of pasta. Um, and they could just say, oh, I want, I want some spaghetti. And we would take their plate back, get them some spaghetti. So we want some, uh, I think I want some rigatoni now. Oh, okay. Then we had nine different sauces, uh, maybe seven, on the sauce and pasta bar. We had red sauce marinara. Uh, we had bolognese. We had a meat sauce with just meatballs. Then we had Roma sausage and meatballs. We had uh, one that was like, like a supreme meat one with brisol in it and everything. We had a, link, uh, a white clam sauce, a red clam sauce, and we had pasta fazool on the bar, too. And then we had nine soups. So I was a prep cook with my... And <laughs> so innocently it all began. Um, and we would make up big pots of minestrone, linguine with white clam sauce, red linguine, Manhattan clam chowder, um, Potato soup, always chili, because the stock pot was used for chili. My dad loved to make chili. I'm thinking of him every time I make a soup. Every time I make soup, I think of my dad or my grandma Rose. Um, sometimes we had really clean broths out there. We had an egg drop soup. Some once in a while, we would, you know, mix up the cuisines and get a little Asian flair going on. He kept it basic. Uh, Pasta Vizula, um, chili, a white bean chili, a red bean chili, minestrone, gotta have a minestrone, um, a beef barley soup we had. Uh, so people could actually, for 5 dollars 
come in and say, I want the all-you-can-eat um, pizza, pasta, soup, and salad bar. All through the 70s and the 80s. Oh, my God. We didn't just do pizza. We did. We were, like, one of the first people to do pineapple and Canadian bacon, Hawaiian pizza. We did um, clams. We did a clam casino pizza. We did a, a seafood pizza. We we began with the any way you want it, 30 minutes or less. And my, my dad went up against, like, David and Goliath, he went up against somebody who tried to use that, another chain that tried to use that. And it was all over our menus and all over everything. And I remember he came to me and he said, Maria, you save everything from the restaurant. I do. I was like a family historian. I, if there was a menu, I would grab it. If there was a recipe, he knew I was writing it down. Um, if there was a new napkin, a new wine list, a new dessert uh, in our, in our, it started, we made a gourmet like dessert cabinet or whatever, I was right down. My, my stepmother made just about all of the cheesecakes, which could go up against any New York style cheesecake or Eddie's cheesecake or Cheesecake Factory, quite frankly. She made awesome cheesecakes. And they loaded up that um, dessert tray with everything and muffins and everything. My kids used to love to do when they would come into the restaurant. My daughter, I can still remember my daughter and my son. I would have to empty their pockets. We would have those little buttery cream mints on the salad bar. And uh, they would run by at the end. And my father and my stepmother would encourage them. They'd be like, go get yourself some mints. They'd run up there and stack their pockets full of the buttery, creamy, different color that melt in their mouth. And mints would like taste them now. Kids. I was always emptying their pockets of mints. We always had a ton of bones to bring home and make food. Um, so my smolch, it's just me. Basically, I took my my um, my spices out and some of that chicken, the little, it's still going to keep from the surface. I just took that out. Very simple. I don't want my camera to fall into the thing. But anyways, my grandma would make the soup totally different than the restaurant because we had different portions, of course. My father's mother made chicken soup totally different than my mother's mother. Um, one time I got really sick with a really bad flu, and it wasn't going away for nothing. It just wasn't. And I had a fever. Like, it's kind of like this time. I had a fever for like, I don't know, 20 days or something. And it went from like 110 pounds to like... 80 something pounds and I was eating but I was sweating like crazy it was probably hyperthyroidism then but we didn't know it um and she put me to bed I went to her house she put me to bed and every morning she would say okay you stay in this bed my father's room she would chuck me into the bed like you would need an iron rod to get under the sheets. She was like, I couldn't move. Like, Stay here, don't move. How come? <laughs> Who can? Go to sleep. It is something years old. She would grab her little purse, walk to the store. She had a car, but she would walk because she liked the exercise. My, my grandma Mary. And, uh, she would go get her chicken, come home fresh with the chicken, and make that chicken up. And sometimes she would, she did a, like a clear bone broth, really deep, clear bone broth. Um, it was good. And then sometimes if she knew that somebody was sick, she wanted to make it better. She would whisk up just an egg, a few egg yolks, really good, and temper it a little bit, like, back and forth, and then whisk just the egg yolk into the soup. Other times, 
she would take the um, the white the whole egg and just run her fork back and forth and it was like uh, she called it rag soup but I think there's a name for it stracciatelli I think it's called it I gotta find the name for it I'm gonna move this about again um, so it wasn't like an egg drop it was like I'd look at it and go what's that white stuff floating in my <laughs> I said, eat it. Good for you. Protein. <laughs> so, both grandmothers did it different. When she'd use her chicken face, and she'd uh, already have her beans soaking, her white bean, and she'd make like a pasta visual. Pasta visual. She'd throw. It was the 70s before we had box pasta in our family. I just did it. That's right where I want it. I want everything to stay tender. I don't. Am I going to taste? You bet I'm going to taste. I can't taste much because I can't taste much. My senses are just gone. Because I don't want the ham to get too um, weird. Like, I don't want it to get too dried out. <laughs> Better word for it, right? I don't want it to get funky. You want to taste the ham when it's in your potato soup. Okay. So, I might be juicy still. That's the word I'm looking for. You can use a measuring spoon, but I don't. I know I got... A good size amount of tablespoon of butter in there. So I'm putting a tablespoon of flour. I know I have a tablespoon of oil and I have the fat from that. I'm putting two tablespoons, maybe a little more. You don't have to do this. Everybody makes their stuff too hard. I bet this is the way I do. I'm going to crank up my heat just a little bit and just cook down my flour in there for a good five minutes. Maybe three, maybe five. I don't know. I'm going to turn off the camera and come back when it's ready. And I'm going to, while I've got that done, I'm going to chop up my potatoes. So you just want to cook this down till really it smells like pie. Mm, if you were just doing flour and butter and oil, it would smell like a pie crust. Okay. Um, I can't smell, but I can kind of smell the pie that happened. You want to cook the flour. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn off the camera and let this do its thing. Five minutes. And I'm going to keep stirring it. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to add chicken broth to this. Um, and the chicken broth I've chosen to use, even though I have a ton of chicken broth cooking over here in my stock pot, I love this broth. It's called College Inn. It's 50% less sodium. You will not find any less sodium chicken broth in a can anywhere. And I was out last night trying to grab stuff from the store because of the cyclone bomb. <laughs> well, you know, I got three phone calls yesterday from the RDNs and prepare for the power to go out and make other arrangements. I was like, okay. So everybody went to the store. Walmart's shelves were emptying quick last night. I was there. So I... They're the only ones I can find that sell this. Wegmans used to sell it, but um, it's really good. It's 99 cents, and it's 50% less sodium. The amount of sodium it has in it is 720 milligrams for an entire can. Remember, I cook low sodium, and I know a lot of people that eat my food when I share like to be low sodium, so... I go with it. You like the sodium? Go for it. 
already going to have enough sodium because I've got the ham in there. Even though I rinsed it, I really do everything I can to keep the sodium low. But I'm going to tap this with some mix of sharp cheddar, pepper jack, monster, and yeah, I am going to put a tiny bit of Velveeta in there because sometimes when you got to go with a little bit of processed, I also hear sharp cheddar and Colby Jack, so I don't know what I'm going to use that. So I'm going to save my cheese for my macaroni and cheese. So I'm not going to put a lot of cheese in this. <sighs> I should just keep going for a second and then just turn off the camera. Because the next thing I'm going to add to this with a little bit of water is over here my broccoli. I'm not going to add all of it though because I'm going to save just a little bit of broccoli for my pasta and broccoli with garlic that I want. So that's good. And I'm even going to chop it down a little bit. Just so that there's a little color in all of this. And this is going to boil more. I didn't want to cook my broccoli with the smithereens. I just wanted it to be, um, so you can get a fork through it and turn bright green. I can't see that it's bright green. It's bright green. Um, so I just wanted, I cooked it in my fourth burner, only at QVC. Pot that is coming in so handy. You can always have a little bit of broth going there, tea. I'm going to throw a quick pasta in there. And we don't utilize that third burner much. So now I've got my broccoli in there with my... And that's going to give it more starch. Let's get out of here. And save my broccoli. And put my little bit of water in there. And I'll be right back because i got to catch my phone. Okay, I'm just going to call that telemarketer a really our genie. I wonder if they got the message with, um, remember last year in western New York in Rochester, like, what was it, March, April? And we had that really horrible windstorm. I, mean, I think my aunt was, like, in her living room with a tree in the middle of her living room seven days or some such nonsense. I mean, everybody, everybody had no power. And Governor Mario Cuomo came to Western New York and pretty much said, shame on you guys with your emergency preparation. Right? Because there should have been an emergency preparation. And we went so long without power. Everybody did. And our apartment complex had a backup generator, but it would only go for so long, so you had so many hours. But my people, like my aunts that were out in Gre Greece, was just a mess, and people had to go. Thank God for Unity or Regional Register Health. Now they opened up and just let people stay there. Um, there were places people could go, but you also had to be home for the clearing of the tree and the living room and all this, everything, right? It was a mess. So, uh, I keep getting phone calls from the RGB. Let me know if I want to be safe, I should leave my home. They don't tell you where to go. They just are like, um, <laughs> they, they tell you we're going to have destructive winds, ice, rain, snow. I believe this woman just said thunder snow. Hurricane winds with ice and snow, power outages are expected, trees down, la 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 la. Nowhere in there does it tell you where to go or what to do. It just says, uh, just um, make arrangements to leave now while you can. <laughs> like, okay, now you suckers are just planning for it because you don't want to do your job. Then, in West Aranaquit, where I am, they're using this funky new stuff on the roads. Uh, it's not salt. I don't like it. I think they're calling it fire rock something or whatever. It's actually making it more slushy, I think. But, 
Um, I'm not going anywhere. What I do when there's a storm? I cook. Um, okay, so what I have here, I should show you this way. That looked weird. What I have here, my potatoes. I was able to get potatoes this week. Yeah. I had a fever of 103 and I walked a 45 mile an hour wind. So am I afraid of the storm? No. I fell down about 20 times, hurt my back again. Am I afraid of a storm? No. Um, I went and got a bag of potatoes. They had very few potatoes left the other day. All the potatoes were like this. All their, their $1.99 uh, five pound bags of potatoes were all like, Their potatoes all look this big. Probably from Thanksgiving, I don't know. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrub these up and I'm going to leave some of the skin on in areas that it's not too bad because it's a very thin skin, the white cooking potato. Um, and I want my potato soup to be very rustic and colorful. And um, I'm going to start adding my broth. I'm going to take some of the broth from my stock pot, put it in there. I'm going to take some of the collagen in. Um, and I don't have any salt in that yet. So I'm going to go scrub up my potatoes, peel where I need to, chop them down. And this is really nice and thick now. Jeez, with the lighting here. It's really nice and thick. That's what I want it to be. So I'm going to start adding the liquid. And that's the roux. See, it gets real flowery. There you can see. Now you can start thickening it. I'm going to thicken it. And I'm just going to do cheese at the very end because I don't want this to have a lot of cheese in it. Um, so I'm going to turn this right down to low. I'm going to keep my stock pot going forever because it just smells good. It's making me feel good. And I'll come back and show you when it's done. Okay, so I'm back. I've scrubbed down my potatoes. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and add. Sorry. I'm eating all my broccoli. I don't think it's going to make it to the pasta. I thought I really needed pasta this morning. A good breakfast is just, just some broccoli. It's good. So I'm going to add my chicken broth. And I wanted to tell you also, um, I put some crushed hot pepper. I'm going to just a little smidgen more. You don't have to, but I want the heat. Um, I'm just going to give it a little. That's good. And I'm going to throw some in my stock pot too. Cause you want your metabolism to fight the cold, flu, whatever the heck it is. Now I'm going to put just a little bit of black pepper in here. And now is the only time you're going to see me salt it. I'm just going to... To a very dusty with salt. Because we're going to be adding potatoes, and potatoes really are like little sponges. They just soak up salt. You need salt with potato. I might add some rosemary to this. I might add some paprika. I just really haven't said it yet. I'm just going with it as I go. It's cyclone cooking. Just gotta have fun. So, it's a nice, um, damn this light. Nice thick. You see the color that it is. Maybe that is the right color. So the green with the ham. It's really pretty. Pretty soup. That's all I care about. Is it pretty? No, I'm joking. Because I can't taste nothing. No, I'm just kidding. I actually can taste and smell now today because when I was prepping my vegetables up and chopping everything down and First thing I always check for with celery, if it's really fresh, you can smell that pepper, that crisp, peppery smell. And I broke into my celery and I was like, yes, yes, it's still good. Because you never know. Even when you go to pick produce, you never know. Um, then I check to make sure that my eyes do water with the onions. When I'm chopping down my onions, if my wa eyes aren't watering, that onion's not going to be doing me any good. That's the way I feel about it. 
Like, I'm just like, okay, save that one for the tuna salad or the chicken salad or the egg salad or whatever, but it's not going in a soup. So I'm going to let this thicken again. Um, and it will. But I don't need it to thicken. Save time. All those potatoes are here. They're going in. I got a lot of potato from those three big potatoes. So, what I decided to do, I decided to add the rest of the broccoli, or maybe save a couple stalks for me. So I want it to be, I want it to be even with the color. Maybe not save the color. It's mine right there. It's mine. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like broccoli. I mean, like, I love broccoli. Alright. I'm going to wrap all my potatoes in. Chop down my broccoli again. Did before. Nobody wants to eat a tree. So I have my ham, my carrot, my celery, my onion, my flour, my butter, my olive oil, my one can 50% low sodium, 100% fat free natural collagen, 700 and something milligrams of sodium. I rinse my, I rinse my ham. And that's not going to be giving people congestive heart failure. You, the last thing you need is more sodium when you're congested. Okay. Now I'm going to use my can and I'm going to put water in here. One can. Well, actually, I already have water that I put here. So I'm going to put right to there. Cover my potatoes. I'm actually going to fill up my multi-purpose can. I'm just going to keep this on even. I'm going to let it cook down. And then I'm going to take my potato masher. I'm going to mash some of it, but I'm going to leave some of that in there. I'm also going to grab some of my chicken broth and add it to it at the end. And when it gets nice and thick, then I'm going to add the cheese when I take it off the fire. So I'm just going to keep adding more cold water to my stock over here, over there, and um, let it keep simmering. Um, it'll slow down simmering when you add your water, but um, if you don't add enough, it'll get too salty. Um, and I know I'm going to make a chicken soup. And I'm going to make chicken fricassee because I'm going to make my bread later. I'm going to make a couple loaves of homemade white bread. And I got the recipe on uh, delicious dishes. Nicole cooks easy white bread, everyday white bread. It's fantastic. Easy, easy. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to be working on is my dough, which I should have gotten done earlier. But, so I have, this is going to simmer away. I'm going to cook my pasta in here. I'm going to cook my, um, actually I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to get another pan out, cook my pasta up, and just set it aside. I might not. I might do a, a macaroni and cheese. I saw my cousin, uh, Sybil, posted, hey, Sib, thank you for sending me the comfort and joy picture of our kids and the family. And you guys, it's gorgeous. Um, I like the plaid going on there. I really do. You know, usually you guys take a Christmas picture that, um, you know, it's got all the Christmas jelly stuff around it. And you keep it up all year because it's you guys that I love having all the pictures. But, um, you know, like summertime, you look at it and it just seems out of place. Um, so you have enough pictures of the kids and, you know, all year round. 
but um, I don't. I just have pictures of my kids usually at the holidays, so, so I'm so grateful that you put together that album of um, my time with raising the kids and then your time with raising the kids, and we blended beautifully, I think. And um, But, like, last year's was like, ho, 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 or fa, la, 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 la. And I love that picture. And I'm like, it's a Christmas picture. It's still up in September, September August. <laughs> this one with the gingham, is it the, the plaid? Whoever picked that out was genius because I can keep it now all year. Thank you for sending it to me. I didn't mean to be, you know, rude about it, but every other year you've given me one for Christmas or um, sent me it in a card, so... I went, I went they could, because I, I, I know you guys went on a camping trip and took a ton of pictures, and I wanted to turn it into a lovely picture, and that looks good. That was one of my favorite pictures of you guys. Some of them I didn't like. You guys were sticking your tongues out and being cuckoo, but um, yeah, thanks for the picture. Okay, so um, it's up and framed already. Um, so my cyclone... Bomb storm soup is potato broccoli. Yeah, I used a carrot, onion, and celery base. You don't need to. It's potato, broccoli, ham. Um, I'm going to let it cook down. I've got it on medium high. My chicken stock is going to stay out of that. I want it to maintain a whirlpool. Or else you're just cooking a pot of bacteria, quite frankly. So you want it to maintain about a bubble every three seconds, a little. You don't want it to boil away. If your stock keeps boiling away, you're just going to make a really cloudy soup. And here's another thing. My grandmother, my, mother, my mother's mother would skim the soup a little bit, but she didn't skim too much. And a lot of times she would take the stock and just portion it out and stick it in the freezer and wait for the fat to come to the top and just take that up. Whereas my mother, my father's mother, I watched her every day and she, it was like a meditative thing with her. She skimmed as it was cooking out. She just stood there all day as it was coming up to the top, like she does with her sauce and gravy and everything else. So... You can do it whatever way you want. No, my dad's mom would say, that's the lazy way to make soup. My, my, but she loved my grandma Rose's cooking. Um, so I remember one day I said to her, um, my other grandma does it that way. And she said, oh, she's probably saving the fat. <laughs> it was, people have, it's just so funny when we look at our, uh, Females in our family, and everybody puts their own spin on it. I think it comes down to what our family's like, what we like, and what's convenient for us. Um, what our goal is. My goal is to batch cook every week. So that I don't have to cook every day. And it's uh, economical. I'm looking for my... Washcloth. Okay. I threw that one away, so I'm going to get another one. Um, yeah, because when you're working with poultry and you're wiping your counters down, throw it away. It needs to get more sick. So, um, I'm going to go get myself another dishcloth. And I might add some sweet potato for this, but I don't know. I think I'm going to make my regular bread. Um... And then I'm going to use a heel that bread for my macaroni and cheese with my chicken, my brack, uh, and my spinach. And then I'm going to um, use my bread for dunking in my soup. And uh, I can toast up that bread and use it for chicken fricassee or chicken a la king. Um, I make my own dumplings. My mom's mom used bisquick, but I like to make my own. Um, that my mother-in-law taught me a recipe of. Um, but that'll be later in the week. I'm going to freeze a lot of this. Um, so I got some heat in here with the crushed hot pepper. I got some heat in there. 
Only thing I'm going to add at the end to my actual chicken soup that I'm going to make, because I really like Annie Burrell's, um, Chef Annie Burrell's recipe. It's kind of like she calls it like her soul chicken soup. Um, and it's really good for when you have a cold. Is at the end, her flavor agents she uses are um, nutmeg, cinnamon, just a pinch of nutmeg, cinnamon, and lemon uh, juice. And oh, if you're congested or feeling stuffy or just under the weather, man, that's what you want. So I might add some rosemary and paprika at the end. I'm probably going to mash this down. A little. Um, I'm gonna wait and just add a little flavor from my homemade chicken broth over there at the end. And then I'm just gonna I'm gonna take it off the fire and throw in some um, cheddar cheese. I don't know. I got a mix. I got monster, white cheddar, hard cheddar, um, sharp cheddar, mild cheddar, and I have a little, just a tiny little bit of Alveda. I'm gonna play with. Yeah, I do. I'm gonna keep skimming this, and then I'll come back and I'll show you everything I made and talk about some serious, serious multiple personality things um, that I've been putting off for almost two years. And the subject matter will be Prince Rogers Nelson. Prince, the musician, some say is formerly known, Prince the formerly known, yeah, the artist formerly known as Prince, and the purple one, and mm, so many names. There's a reason for that. Um, Prince did self-disclose on Oprah Winfrey in 1996 that he was diagnosed from a expert uh, with multiple personality, and that he was in analysis to find out why he had them and he was meeting all of them, he was going in search of all of them. Um, Prince went into um, therapy with a life partner and also a protege and um, people that managed him thought it would be really good. Um, because he was a combination of rigid, controlling, um, trying to recreate his family with his band, um, but not controlling, not rigid. <laughs> Salacious, mixing sex with God. They couldn't figure it out. So they sent him to analysis. And it was clear he was abandoned, rejected, tossed out of his house when he was 12. A very turbulent, turbulent childhood. He had a lot of bullying that went on when he was younger for his size, his race, and for having seizures. He was shamed for having seizures at his church, at his Seventh day Adventist church. His mother had several relationships before she got married, and when they went through their divorce, father and the mother. Um, uh, Prince was really sexualized by his mother's education. <clears throat> Excuse me. Playboy. His father, where his father worked, um, was a jazz club, but there were dancers that took their clothes off. Him. And Prince would um, go watch his father play and when he got there you know it was like a little burlesque show but it was classy so there was a lot of jazz a lot of good music and then the girly show um and a lot of his ideas for design for his costumes wearing underwear and acting out all he did on stage some of that was just that but a lot of what he did was with because he was with more than one. Um, when he was dating Denise Matthews, aka Vanity, she also was diagnosed multiple. Uh, big Hollywood doctor. Um, <laughs> um, but she believes she got 
delivered when she became a born-again Christian of demonic personas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Two other people in his life that he was very close to were also diagnosed in the late 80s, early 90s. Until Prince got to a point where he realized, hey, I can do this therapy myself. I can just engage with everyone, keep performing with everyone, and uh, keep performing, keep doing everything I do with everyone. And everybody thought it was a savvy move for him to get away from Warner Brothers, but it, it, it wasn't. And I'm going to come back. This is going to be my brave video. See, cooking calmed me down so I can talk about this. Um, Prince was very active in the multiple community. A lot of people that uh, subscribed to being multiple or were diagnosed multiple in the 80s and 90s. Those of us war horses out here still. Um, that went through the trauma medical model and integration. Years of therapism. We... All new Prince and Prince's group. A lot of people that knew Prince really well knew that Prince was diagnosed multiple. Um, they chalked it up to, well, Prince just thinks he's multiple. Um, or it's part of his stage, whatever, mystique. Some of it was. Um, but he, was, he truly developed with more than one. Many of us do. Why? Because it's not uncommon. But he definitely had some traumas in his background that he needed to work through. And he did that. Um, he did that through his music. He did that through internal dialoguing and journaling with others. He did that through designing with them. He did that by honoring them and allowing them to dance, play, play whatever instrument they wanted, um, wear the clothes they wanted, and uh, act out their emotions on stage. Um, I first, the first email I got from Prince and Company, which um, the name of his group was the symbol. It was unpronounceable because he believed he was a child of God. They all were children of God, plural, male, female coming from the Alpha and Omega of the circle, the never-ending circle of life, which we would all return to, that God sent down the representation of God in the form of Jesus to be a willing sacrifice. And at the time, he was learning that it wasn't a cross, but it was a stake, a pole in the ground that Jesus died on. So if you go look at the symbol, you will see the big round circle on top. That is the Alpha and Omega, the never-ending circle of life. The heavenly spirit coming down. And still got the cross there because it also represents the male and the female, but a willing sacrifice. And what do we do when we're willingly surrendering? We're sacrificing when we're surrendering. We're like, surrender, I surrender. Go look at the symbol, surrender, surrender, self-sacrifice, surrender. Nobody killed Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. The Pharisees and scribes didn't kill Jesus. Jesus came to this earth with a purpose that he had to fulfill in 33 years. He knew he had to go on that stake, pole, whatever you want to call it, cross. He had to die. Um, he could have defended himself at any point. He could have. He could have. He knew he had to. Um, Prince really understood that. Um, oh, God. Um, the stake is representative of the arrow down into the ground. He talked about the afterlife a lot because he knew the purpose of us coming to this earth was again to die and go back to the Alpha and Omega forever um, heavenlies. He knew he came from spirit. He, some of us remember being in the spiritual world more than others. 
was going to say about that. Um, um, and if you look to the left of the symbol, you will see what is a trumpet, the ram's horn. Because at the end, he knew all this is going to go circular, circular forever. Jesus came down to show us a new kingdom, a new, a new, a new way. He saved us willingly. He didn't have to. Male and female equality. What what happened on that cross? Justice made you and I have equality, justice, fairness, health, happiness, whatever. And not until that trumpet blows. The apocalypse, the rapture, whatever you want to call it, end time, will the plan be complete. Um, he consulted God. They all did together. They wanted an unpronounceable name because they were learning that God's name, if you had to pronounce it, it was a bunch of symbols spelling out Yahweh. Jesus would have been Yeshua. Um, Jehovah Witnesses took what Moses had written, the Jehovah, with how they added the vowel and everything, and the characteristics, and he thought that was even more interesting because you had Jehovah Nairo, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Provider, Jehovah Salvation, Jehovah Healer, Jehovah Comforter, Jehovah Joy. You had all these Jehovahs. Which were God. So he was like, okay, I'm just like God. I'm God's child. We all are. And nobody can pronounce our name. It turned out to be when God, he went into deep prayer and fasting with that. When, that's when everything erupted. And he had this great revelation about being a slave to Warner Brother. And Everybody thought, oh, he created the symbol to get over on Warner Brothers. No, there was the blessing by obeying God. He was able to use that symbol to continue to produce music. Um, when he was interviewed on Oprah, I'm going to skim this soup too. Um, I'm going to wash my spoon so I don't cross contaminate anything. Um, he was on Oprah. Oprah had already, um, Oprah had already interviewed Cameron West, and I can't think of the name of the group right now. I'm sorry, Cam. <laughs> Holy stupid of me. I'll get it. I'm ready to thing. She had already, um, really interviewed quite a few multiple systems, and most of all now. Trudy Chase and the Troops, who wrote One Rabbit House and produced their own movie, Voices Within, um, and were advocates and went about. So Oprah had already been very open to multiple personality um, and understanding what it was, what it came from. And when Prince said, he had, you know, they had found a child in him, and he had more people, and he did the classical thing that all of us that have been diagnosed back then did, and do, and still do. Um, his, uh, Oprah's response was like, really? You have actually more than one personality with you? And he looked at her sideways, he, uh, what he, we Skyped, and he said, um, we Skyped, we, we emailed for years, we, yeah. For a long time I thought I had a stalker, because you can go look at your analytics and see what device is coming from, where it's coming from, and it was coming from, like, Melbourne, UK, it was coming from... Portugal, it was coming from Athens, Greece, it was coming from Spain, it was coming from Toronto, 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 um, Florida, um, New York, LA, Minneapolis, Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Paul. It's this person. Um, he actually signed with the symbol and then eventually started individually, they wrote me 
and uh, signed with their individual names, or if they were in a group, which we all know happens many times. You're coexisting, you're co-running with a bunch, and so you sign everyone's, everyone signs their name. Um, he was very cautious at first. Um, he loved my channel because um, I looked at what he said was the problem, the media. The media. And at the time, there was no other channels out there looking at the media. They were just looking at... <laughs> Prince, Prince was keen to people that made money off people. And that's what my channel was looking at. I keep creating chaos, disorder, and disease and pathologizing everything, you can make money. Quite, they're creating a storm right now. Got a new name for it. Cyclone bomb storm because there's a little bit of thunder happening in places with it. And it's going to be windy. How does it make them money? Everybody ran to the store. They're going to save money on they're not going to, there's certain roads they're not going to clear. Because they're just going to tell people to stay off the roads. they going to save money. They make storms. Uh, the prince was keen to all this. Long time ago. Chemtrails. What chemtrails did. I'm going to keep skimming this one. I'm going to wash my spoon again. With something on it. Um, so. Um. I would say if you're really worried about you got people that can't eat meat or whatever, if you're really super duper worried about it, use two separate spoons, but just wash your spoon really good with soap and water. I'm a skimmer. I like the meditative sand that my grandma, that your grandma Mary did. <laughs> I could zen out skin and soup all day, but I won't. <laughs> I won't. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back and talk more about Prince. I've been waiting almost two years to do this video. Then I'm going to do a video about Christine Costner sees more all things eat. She passed away July 24th, uh, 2016. And I've been waiting a respectable time for her family and everything to talk about um, the real mess she got into by making a movie deal with 20th Century Fox. And how that all got rolling. So, starting the new year off with a big cyclone bomb. Breaking news. Yeah, Prince moved, breathed, lived with many. Maite totally understood it because several of his protégés and love partners were also diagnosed with multiple. Um, Manuel and never really, she didn't argue it with him. She just believed that he knew, he knew that she believed that he thought he was multiple. But she didn't really think he was. Um, Kirk always knew he was, and he could be whoever he wanted to be in front of Kirk. One of his family members, one of his siblings, was diagnosed multiple in the 90s. Um, huh. um, so he saw it becoming the epidemic it was becoming in. The money. Cash cow. People are becoming. He had a lot to say about Illuminati made, industry, Hollywood made multiples, and then the real deal. He said, he was the real deal. He said, I grew up with many before I even met anybody in the industry. Um, and so did the people that were being diagnosed. Um, we talked a lot about what you have going on now with people doing this and this and all that. It's kind of like a cool kid's code sign to each other. It's really not the real Illuminati. If you want to understand the real Illuminati, you have to really go study Freemasonry. Freemasonry. Is it touching the Hollywood industry? Yup. 
but it's more it's being run more like a a mob mentality like a mafioso family where they have a connection everywhere they have their own special doctors their own special people that they have they're all connected um The true Illuminati is really, there are six corporations going on seven that run the world. They're very tight. Uh, they branch out globally, and they keep it strong. Um, their hands are in everything, but they began with free masonry. Um, when you see these entertainers bringing out the Egyptian pyramids and the, the lions and all the wearing the ram's horns and everything. A lot of that is baloney. Um, it's actually a cover for the real Illuminati. The real Illuminati is right in front of our face all day long. Turn on your TV. Any commercial you see, they're enough. Um, but that'll be another video where I talk about, let's see, a book called Cinema and Psychiatry, and Hollywood on the Couch. Um, I talk about with the advent of the birth of photography and cinema, how movie and cinema went to psychiatry, which was also at its birth, and they got together, created a lot, um, and made a business, made a disorder business, a pathology business. They can make a lot of money. Um, Okay, so that's my brave video. Very long if you hung in there. God bless you. I'm going to go work on my soups and then get my macaroni and cheese going. Do some cleanup and I'll come back and do another video. Hopefully some shorter videos when they're done. Thanks for hanging in there. Take care. Stay warm. Bye-bye.